morning. So 1 Samuel chapter 22, I'll uh, we'll jump right into it. It says in verse 1, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Dullam. And, with his, and when his brethren in his father's house heard it, they went thither to him. So this is him, of course, departing from having, you know, the previous chapter. He's going into the house of God. He's uh, meeting with the priest of Himelech, and he's requesting the show bread. He's eating that, and he gets the sword of Goliath. And he's kind of covering his tracks, kind of not letting Ahimelech know that, you know, he's on the run from Saul. And we gather from last week that Ahimelech, you know, is ignorant of this entire dispute. He doesn't understand that, that David has broke away from Saul and is running for his life. And David's very careful to tell him, oh, I'm on, a, you know, I'm on this clandestine mission. You know, I can't tell anybody about it. The, the, the king sent me on this top secret mission and that's why I don't have any food. I had to go, you know, I had to make haste and so on and so forth. And that's an important detail from last week that plays into what we see taking place here this week. But that's where David is departing um, from. That's where he's departing thence and escaping to the cave of Dullam. And of course, it says there when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And this wasn't just because, oh, let's go pay David a visit. You know, it'd be nice to see him. It's been a while. It's because they're fearing for their life as well, because you know Saul has just gone completely off the rails. As if you haven't figured that out already, and this this chapter just makes it, you know, glaringly obvious how wicked Saul has become, unfortunately. But they're fleeing for their for their for their uh, for their safety's sake. Okay, and verse three makes that real clear. It says then David went thanks to to the Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king, uh, Moab, let my father and mother pray thee come forth and be with thee. So he's seeking san you know sanctuary for his mother and his father. You know, they're probably older now. They can't be running around the mountains with David and his, his band of men. You know, they're men of war. They're, you know, able to, to, to do this. So he's seeking solace for them to go and to have a safe place to stay. And, you know, it's unfortunate that God's people are being driven out of their own land into a heathen land to the Moabites, you know, which are, you know, an enemy of Israel. But there they are, you know, there's some politicking probably going on here. You know, the king of Moab probably might know that David's going to be ruler one day. Hey, you know, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine, kind of thing. Don't want to get into all that. But uh, look at verse 2 there. It says, And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. So it's still not a very big group of people. I mean, Saul's got thousands of people in all likelihood. And I mean, that's cap, uh, you know, David before he left was a captain over a thousand. So he, he's got this small band of men and it's interesting that he didn't get, you know, the, the cream of the crop, so to speak, right? He, what did he get? He got everybody that was in debt, everyone that was discontented, everybody, you know, that was in distress. So he's getting all the people that are dissatisfied with Saul's leadership. They're all coming to David. They're all fleeing to him. And what we could see from this is that you know, mankind, you know, people, groups of people, we, requ we require leadership. We have to have people in positions to lead us, right? They're, 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 that's just the way we're built. I mean, that's, you know, in every, in so many different areas in our life, you think about in the home, you know, the God has ordained that the, the husband is the head of the home, that he is to lead that home, that the wife is to be in submission to her husband and to follow his leading. Children are to follow their parents, you know, we're just, we're made that way to need leadership in our lives. You know, even on, the bo even on the job, think about the fact that somebody has to be in charge on the job. You have to have somebody leading the thing. You know, not, I, I don't know of a business, maybe it's out there, but I'm sure, you know, I've never seen it. It probably doesn't function very well where everybody shows up and the boss just says, okay, what do you guys want to do today? What should, what should we do to make money? You know, the people, the employees, they show up and say, tell us what to do. Show us where to go. What are we supposed to do today? Somebody's got to be in charge. It's the same way in the local church. You know, somebody's got to, you know, determine what needs to be preached. Someone's got to hold a line on doctrine. Somebody's got to, you know, send people out to go preach the gospel. Someone's got to do all the, thing, all the things to make the house of God run. What I'm getting at is that everybody needs, that, that mankind needs leadership, you know. And there's a real need for leaders today, you know, especially in the house of God. You know, in all these areas, you know, in, in, in houses today, in homes, men need to step up and be the leaders that they're supposed to be. And, and what we see here is that people naturally gather toward leaders. They look for a leader that they can follow. And they, now I want to point out the fact here that they did this of their own accord. Okay, they, they came to David, right? Because it's not like David's leading a rebellion. David's not like, he's not pulling an Absalom here, right? Because that's exactly what happened when, when Absalom rose up. He went, 
you know, and he, he would greet every man before, you know, and he would, he would, he would smooth them and, and try to win them over to his side and, and, and so on and so forth and end up leading a rebellion against the king. That's not what David's doing. So don't get the wrong impression because we, if we recall from 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul told Samuel, or Samuel told Saul rather, very clearly that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You know, a rebellious people is, is a wicked people, typically. But when people are discontented, you know, when, and this group of people that are going to Saul, I mean, they're oppressed people. I mean, that's what it sounds like to me. And I don't, and I don't think discontented means that they wanted more than they were allowed. You know, they, they had the one car garage, but, you know, they thought, hey, if we get David in power, you know, well, there'll be a turkey in every oven and two cars in every garage, right? They, they, they're discontented with the fact that they're what? That they're in debt, you know, that there's all this, that, that the release is not being given. The, the commandments of God are not being followed. They're, uh, you know, they're in distress. You know, that they're worried about the enemies around them. They, God's not blessing their country. So they see a, a righteous guy rise up and just naturally, just of their own accord, they gather themselves unto him at the risk of their own life. You know, they say, hey, we're going to uh, join ourselves unto David. And they probably knew that in so doing, that they were kind of putting their own necks on the line with Saul because they understood that David was on the run. But it just goes to show us that mankind will gravitate towards leadership, good or bad. Okay? And, and the, the type of leadership, you know, the, the, the type of people that follow uh, is determined by the leadership. You know? Good people, people who want the right thing, are the ones that are gravitating towards David. The people who aren't really, don't really care about all these things, they're, they're content to stay with Saul. You know, and, and, you know, obviously with everything that's going on in our country today, we're still in the, have yet to have elected our, our next president, you know, but we're choosing the leaders that we want. And I've already preached about this, but these, both of these leaders are a perfect reflection of the American people. I mean, how couldn't they be? That's the people that they're electing. I mean, you, can, you say, well, I don't know if it's really a reflection of the American people. But they're American people, the ones that are putting them in office. They're saying, oh, yeah, I approve of this guy and everything he represents, he gets my vote. Oh, I approve of this guy, and he gets my vote. Okay? And I don't want to go on and on about voting. I'm just, you know, I thought, it, obviously, you can't talk about leadership and not mention that. But it makes it real clear here that we need to have proper leadership. David draws these men to him because he's a righteous leader. You know, he's not leading a rebel rebellion here. He's not revolting against the king. He's just, hey, I'm going to go run for my life. I just, I got to save my own skin here. And in, in the process of doing that, other people are gathering to him. And he's becoming a leader without even really trying. Verse 3, it says, And David went thence to Mizpeh of Moab, and he said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth and be with thee, till I know what God will do for me. And he brought them uh, before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with them all the while that David was in the hold. So it's an interesting phrase there. He says at the end of verse 3, Till I know what God will do for me. And if you remember last week, it kind of seemed like David's faith was kind of waxing a little bit. It was waning. You know, he's, he's not exactly sure where his next meal's coming from. He's on the run. He's, he's taking whatever, you know, he's, he's asking for weaponry. But it appears that, you know, he wasn't, it's not like he completely lost all faith. And, Dave, and he still has some faith in God because look at what he's saying there. See, look, he's going to the king of Moab and saying, hey, let my parents dwell safely with you till I know what God will do for me. So he's exercising this patience, isn't he? And this is an important lesson that we can learn from David. David serves a very good example to the rest of us here. If you would, keep something there and go over to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And now, it's, it's easy to say, oh, I'm, I'm being very patient. I'm waiting on the Lord when everything's going great. Right? When, oh, I'm just waiting on the Lord. My, my job's perfect. My family life's perfect. Everything's great at church. My country, you know, there's nothing concerning going on in the country that I live in. You know, the world, everything's just perfect, right? You know, when you've got that Goldilocks life going, everything's just right. You can say, oh, I'm trusting in God. But it's another thing when you find yourself in a position like David to be able to say, wait, I'm going to wait until I know what God will do for me. Waiting out, being patient in the midst of persecution. That's what he's doing here. He's exercising patience in the midst of being persecuted. That's not an easy task. But, you know, it's a, ta it's a lesson that we all need to learn because, you know, if, in all likelihood, we are going to face to some degree or another persecution in our lives. You're going to James chapter 1. It says in 1 Peter 1, it says there that uh, we, uh, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. 
He's saying, look, you rejoice for a season if you, if there only be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. You know, you're to rejoice in those temptations, right? In, and the temptation is just another word for trials, tribulations. And he says in verse 7 that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory. See, when we go through these things, you know, that's what the trying of our faith, that's what makes our faith praiseworthy. When we come out on the other side, having remained faithful to the Lord. You know, when things get tough and things get hard in life, when we go through some trial or tribulation in life, that's not the time to quit on God. That's the time to wait until to see what the Lord will do for you and to let him bring you through the other side because then your faith is found praiseworthy because then it's, 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 it's found precious, you know, more than, than, more than in gold, you know, though it be tried with fire. It be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So, you know, when we go through tribulations in our life, that's not the time to quit. That's the time to, to exercise patience. And if you do that, then you have something at the appearing of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when he comes, he has something to praise you for. Say, I saw you go through, I, I know when you went through that trial, when you went through that tribulation, when you went through that hard time, that season of, of manifold heaviness in your life, and you remain faithful, and now I have something to praise you for. But, you know, what a lot of times happens is we go through those tribulations sometimes, and some people, they, that's when they quit. That's when they throw in the towel. Well, you know what? Your faith is not going to be found unto praise then. What's there to praise? When, when, the, when, the, when the Lord Jesus shows up, oh, when times got tough, you quit. That's, that's going to be a, a, a point of shame. That's going to be something that causes people to hang their heads. Look there in James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. That's the attitude we ought to have. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let her patience have her perfect work, that you may be imperfect and entire, wanting nothing. <coughs> so we're not only to just... In, it's not like we're just supposed to go through persecution and just grit our teeth and just white-knuckle it through the Christian life and just, and just say, oh, my faith is going to be found praiseworthy if I could just hang in there. You know, he's saying, not, yes, hang in there, but he, look, he's saying to count it all joy. You know, we should count it joy when, we're, when God count, finds us worthy to be, have our faith tested. When he decides to test our metal to see what we're made of, we should count that joy. Because it gives us an opportunity to show God that we do love him. That, we, that, that having not seen him, we love him. And that we're going to remain faithful to him no matter what. So it's a, it's a thing to be joyful over. And not only that, but when you look at what David's going through at this point in his life and what he's about to go through for this season in, in his life, is that good people go through hard times. Good pe now, David's a good man. You can't deny it. And in fact, that's the reputation that he has, as we'll see here in a minute, that he's known as a faithful servant, that he's known as a good man, but yet he fi we find him here going through a very difficult season in his life. So it shouldn't be any surprise to us when we, you know, who are good people, who love the Lord, who, who love the Bible, who love going to church, all these things, you know, we find ourselves going through hard times. Or we see some other person who we know has a, you know, reputation for having loved the Lord, faithfulness, you know, so on and so forth. When we see them go through some trial or tribulation, it shouldn't shock us. We shouldn't say, well, what's going on there? That's not right. No, this is, this is the pattern that we see in Scripture. That God's people are not exempt from suffering. In fact, the Bible says quite the opposite, that all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And I know that's, a, that's a verse I feel like I've been saying a lot lately, but we've got to make sure we have our heads wrapped around that. We better make sure we understand that. Because it's going to happen. The question, you know, and the, the point I'm trying to make here is just, you know, get your attitude right now before you go into it. So that it doesn't blindside you and you find yourself, you know, quitting on God or failing in some way. To where you can come out on the other side and say, hey, I have something to praise, that God is going to praise me for. And then you could count it joy. You know, even though it's, I'm not saying it's easy, I'm not going to say you're going to wake up every morning with, the, you know, a 10 foot, you know, smile across your face about what's going on. But at least inwardly in your heart, you can know that at least, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a you know, a light at the end of the tunnel. That God is going to see you through and that there's a purpose behind it. And that you're not, you, you, you know, you're not alone. Good people throughout all time have gone through difficult things and will continue to do so. So he says there, you know, he's in verse uh, 3, he's saying, you know, you know, I pray thee come forth and be with you. Let my parents be with you till I know what God will do for me. So he's being faithful through this hard time. 
you know, he's, he's trusting in the Lord here. And notice in verse 5, it says there, And the prophet Gad said unto David, Abide not in the hold, depart and get thee into the land of Judah. Then David departed and came into the forest of Hereth. So David's patience pays off, right? He says, you know, I'm going to wait here. I'm going to send my parents to this king in, in, uh, in, in Gath, whatever, or wherever, in Moab. And I'm going to wait on the Lord to see what he does. And God honors that. You know, there is an end to it. And he tells him where to go. He says, don't abide in the hold. Get out of the cave of Dullam. Go back into the land of Judah. And David did so. So his patience pays off. Now look at verse 6. And when Saul heard that, that David was discovered, that the men were, uh, and, the, and the men that were with him, now notice, what, now I want to point out here this little here in, in, in the parentheses. You know, it gives us this detail. And I think this is interesting. I think this is important. It says, now Saul abode in Gibeah under a tree in Ramah. First of all, what's with trees and, and, and Saul? Anyone notice that? In the other, other chat, you find him under a pomegranate tree. The guy's just always hanging out under trees. You know, Saul's this guy. He's got it made in the shade, doesn't he? He's just kind of life. Is he, is he, is he running for his life? Is he worried? In fact, you know, he's, he's in Gibeah. That's where he's from. He's at home. He's not hanging out in some cave. He's not having to take his parents to some heathen king and say, hey, keep them here. He's, he's living it up. Things are going easy for him, you know, at, at least from a, wor from a, you know, a worldly perspective or you could at least say at least he's comfortable physically. He's under the tree. You know, it's probably got some fruit hanging on it. He's surrounded, right? He says, having his spear in his hand and all his servants st standing about him. So he's got all these people with him that are on his side, that are supporting him. They're at his beck and call. And he's just taking it easy. And he's at Gibeah, his homeland, where he's from. He's in his familiar surroundings. Complete opposite of what David's going through right now. So he's in his home. He's surrounded by those that are loyal to him. But it's interesting here because despite these familiar surroundings, right, that he has, and despite the fact that he's in trusted company, he has his servants with him, despite all that, Saul has what? He has his, uh, his spear in his hand. I mean, the guy is just ready to defend himself. What, why does he need to have a spear in his hand? I thought you were surrounded by people that were loyal to you. You're surrounded by your servants. You're in your own homeland. You're under a tree. You know, everything's going good for you. Why do you have your spear in your hand? You know, I talked about, this is, this is something that keeps coming up with Saul, and I pointed that out a few chapters ago, how odd it would be for any one of us to just walk around with a deadly weapon in our hand. You know, I mean, obviously we do that, some, these people do that to just exercise their rights. You know, they want to take the AR-15 and go down to the rally or whatever. That's one thing, I get it, but it's another thing to just, you know, sling a rifle over your shoulder and just go to the grocery store. I mean, don't you think you'd get some looks? Right. Do you think some people might call, people probably call the cops. There's a guy walking around, you know, with a carbine or whatever. There's a guy walking around with just a gun in his hand. You know, you would, you would get stopped, okay? Now, obviously, we know that you can carry here and you can have a gun on your hip and so on and so forth, and that's great. But, you know, it would be odd if we just walked around, just, you know, rifle in hand. Hey, how's it going? Just talking to people. People, you know, well, let's try it out soul winning sometime, right? Let's just show up the door with just the AR, just, you know, holstered at a, at a, at a low ready, you know, one in the chamber, finger off the trigger, slung up real nice. From a Baptist church, you know, just want to ask you about your, they're probably at some point in the conversation go, what's up with the gun, man? And they might even assume some things about you. They might say, this guy's paranoid. You know, this guy, this guy thinks that people are out to get him. He's got to be armed all the time. And, and look, just because you're, you're paranoid, you know, doesn't mean that they're not out to get you. Cause no, <laughs> but that's the point I'm making here with Saul, is that despite his faithful, his, 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 uh, his familiar surroundings, despite being surrounded by his servants, he's got to have his spear in his hand. Not near at hand. Not on his persons, not, you know, at arm's length, in his hand. Because he's just, this is where he's at in his life. This is where the madness that he's been driven to. To where he's suspecting anybody and everybody. And we see what that results in here in a minute, right? <coughs> where was I? So his paranoia, right? That's what's going on here. Is, is you can see how paranoid uh, Saul has become. It's evident just right there by those details right there. You know, despite everything being so well, he's got it. But it, it goes on further, and we could see that how his paranoia and his lack of peace 
in his words, not just his actions. Look at verse 7. Then Saul said unto his servants that stood about, And hear now, ye Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? So he's trying to say, hey, look, the son of Jesse, that's referring to David, right? David's not going to do for you what I did for you. So he's, he's just, this is the source of his paranoia, losing power. He's just, he's so obsessed with just hanging on to the power that he's acquired. And then, he, and then you could just see the, the paranoia in verse 8. That all of you have conspired against me. He's just convinced that his own kin, the Benjamites, have conspired against him. Like, you guys are surrounding me, we're all here, and you guys are just waiting to kill me. And there is none that showeth me the son, my, that my son hath made the league with the son of Jesse. And there is none of you that is sorry for me. You know, the self-pity, the self, you know, oh, feel sorry for me. Or showeth to me, unto me that my son hath, hath stirred up my servant against me to lie and wait as at this day. It's like, you guys are against me. Why hasn't anyone shown me this? It's because you guys, you know, he's paranoid. He's thinking you guys are going to turn on me. And it's interesting here because we know that Saul is a saved man. You'll see that at the end of the story. You know, Saul, we know, went to heaven when he died. He's a saved man. He was anointed of the Lord. He was God's anointed. And yet here he is. You know, just like David. David also God's anointed. God, you know, saved. They're both saved people. But notice, notice the two, the difference between the two here. You got one that is just, even though he's in a cave somewhere, uncertain of where he's going to be, what's going to happen on the run for his life, he's trusting in God. And God's honoring him. He's sending him the prophet. He's getting him the word. He's leading him. He's guiding him. And then you have the other guy. Everything seems to be going right, but he has no peace because he's disobedient to God. No peace at all. You know, and that should be a lesson to us. You know, it's going to take a lot more in life for you to have peace that passeth all understanding than just, you know, being in familiar surroundings. You know, making sure that you're in the, you know, everything's just right. It's going to take more than just, you know, uh, uh, you know, physical possessions, just having things. There, there, there's, no, there's no security in that. Look, without the Lord, there is no peace. Amen. None. And I don't care how, and, and you, you could get, have the best of situations. Saul does. I mean, so, and he's, he's suspecting everybody. All the Benjamites are like, what are you talking about? We're here with you. Look, if they wanted to rebel against Saul, they could have done it by now. And they never do. Saul, they, Saul leads them into battle when, at, at, at his death. They're still following Saul to the, and to the day he died. These people are loyal to him and yet he can't see it because he has no peace because he's not right with God. Look, if we want to have that peace, we have to be right with God. And he says here, uh, and he says in verse 9, right? So he asks this question, how come no, basically saying, how come no one's brought this to my attention? Are you guys all against me? Everyone's conspiring against me? I suspect all of you now because nobody's told me about my son. Nobody's bringing any of these things to my attention. You guys must be siding with David. That's what's going on here. He's thinking because nobody's talked to me, no one's bringing David to me, they must be siding with him. Okay. <coughs> but look at verse 9. Then answered Doeg the Edomite, which was set over the servants of Saul and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Himelech, the son of Ahitub. You remember that from last week, right? When David went into the house of God to get the showbread and the sword, it says that Doeg the Edomite was there. That was that detail that I pointed out. And I didn't really go into it. I said, but that's going to come into play next week. This is that guy. Right? So he was the guy that was there. Now he's with Saul. And he said, hey, I saw him. I, when I was down at the priest's house, you know, when I was at the temple, I was at God's house. When I was, you know, when I was detained of the Lord. Remember that's what it said of him? Doeg was there having been detained of the Lord. It's in the previous chapter. And he's saying, look, I saw him when he was there. I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, the priest, right? And he inquired for the Lord of him and gave him victuals. That's talking about, you know, food. He gave him, you know, uh, food to eat. And gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Then sent the, the king to call Ahimelech, the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, and the priests that were in Nob, and they came, all of them, to the king. So what's going on here? So what you have going on here is Saul saying, you guys are all against me, no one's, no one's aiding me, no one cares about me, no one feels sorry for me, no one's helping me fight this battle against David. No one's telling me that my own son has made a league with him, right? He's, he's upset. And then Doeg, the Edomite, he pipes up. He see, and why? Because he sees an opportunity to gain favor with Saul. 
by saying, well, hey, I saw the son of Jesse just the other day. And he goes on and condemns the priests in the process. In the process. Look, David's already condemned. Notice who he's condemning. He's condemning the priest. He's saying, look, the, he said, I saw the sin of Jesse coming down to him like the son of Ahitub, and he inquired of the Lord for him. And he gave him victuals and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. He said, look, I saw him go down to Ahitub, and you know, he was praying for him. He gave him food. He armed him and sent him on his merry way. You should probably do something about that. And why was he doing that? Because he's, he cares so much about you know, routing evil people in, in Saul's kingdom or, you know, bringing the truth. Like, no, because he's trying to gain advantage. And we'll see that here in a minute. But notice he's condemning the priest here. And we'll understand why in a minute. But in the, in, in notice how he goes about in condemning the priest, okay? He's mixing the truth with lies. Okay, look at verse 10 real carefully. It says, and he inquired of the Lord for him. He's saying, I saw him go down to the Himelech, the priest, and he, Ahimelech, inquired of the Lord for him. And he gave him victuals and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Not all of that is true. He's mixing truth with lies. Did Ahimelech give him the sword of Goliath? Yes. Did he give him victuals? Yes. Did he inquire of the Lord for him? We don't see it in Scripture. In fact, we'll see here in a minute where Ahimelech says, I didn't. Look at verse 15. Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me. Ahimelech, when he shows up, he, does not, he completely denies it. I didn't inquire of him. And we'll see, and he, he goes on and explains, why should I? I had no reason to, to inquire of him, for him. There, I thought everything was fine. So, Doeg here, he's telling the truth. Yeah, he gave him victuals. He gave him a sword. But then he's also saying, and he inquired of the Lord. So he's mixing truth with lies. He's making it sound worse than it actually was. Trying to condemn the priest. And why is he trying to condemn the priest? Because he wanted, he's just trying, he's seizing upon an opportunity to gain favor with Saul in hope of getting promotion, riches, whatever, a greater, better position. <clears throat> Look at verse 12, and it says, And Saul said, Hear now, thou son of Ahitub. So, of course, at verse 11, then the king sent to Ahimelech like the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house. And the priests were not, and they came all of them to the king. So Saul hears this news, and he gets all, he get, brings them to him, right? And he says in verse 12, Hear now, thou son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my Lord. And Saul said unto him, Why have you conspired against me? Now, isn't he kind of jumping to conclusions? It, I mean, this is where his head's at. And he's just suspecting everybody. And he's just taking Doeg the Edomite's word just like that. And just saying, Oh, they're conspiring against me. Why have you conspired against me that, and, that, thou, and, that uh, thou and the son of Jesse, and that givest him bread and a sword and has quired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait as it at this day? Now notice Ahimelech's offense, uh, defense here. He's, he's like, whoa, I'm not conspiring against you. This is probably not what he was expecting. And maybe he's expecting, oh, he's going he's gonna, to, he probably heard that, that David came to me on that secret mission he told me about. You know, and I've kept things hush-hush, and I helped him out. He's probably going to say, hey, I appreciate what you did for David there. He gets there, and he's being accused right to his face about conspiring with the son of Jesse. But look at his defense. Ahimelech answered the king and said, Who is so faithful among all thy servants as David? I love this answer. Who is so faithful among thy servants as David, which is in the king's son-in-law, and goeth at thy bidding, and is honorable in all thine house? So Ahimelech, you know, he, this is defense. He's appealing to the goodness of David. What he's saying is like, why would I have, I, what are you talking about? I don't, he's conspiring against you. He's the most faithful person you have in order. He's your son-in-law. He's honorable in thine house. He goeth thy bidding. Uh, I didn't have any reason to suspect him of anything. We're not conspiring. He's denying these charges, right? He denies the accusation. He says in verse 15, did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Far be, uh, be, be it far from me. Let not thy king impute anything unto his servant nor all to his house of my father. For thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. And that's the truth, isn't it? That is the truth. And Saul can't see it. He's so blind by his own fear and insecurities. And, and, and he, he's just not going to hear it. He's not convinced. And he says in verse 16, And thou, and, and, and the king said, Thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech, thou and all thy father's house. He's, he's not even, la a lot. it's like there's no, there's no jury here. There's no court case. There's no day in court for him. He's condemned before he even gets there. This is where Saul's at. So now we can see that all the way back in the beginning of the story where, Saul, where, where, where Samuel's saying, 
hey, if I go anoint the king of David, go anoint the son of Jesse, and Saul hears of it, he's going to kill me. That's what he told him, Lord. Remember that? And you think, whoa, really? But that's exactly what's taking place. Saul has gotten a place he has no problem just killing a man of God, just killing the priest of God, the priest of the Lord. Just for what reason? Because he just suspects him of perhaps maybe conspiring against him. Now, I, I wonder, but when I, as I read this, I can't help but wonder, did Saul, did, did Saul condemn Ahimelech because he didn't believe him? Did he, hear, did he hear, Saul, hear him say out and say, hey, I didn't do this. You know, I thought David was your man. I didn't inquire from him, be it far from me. You know, spare me. I do nothing of all this. Was it that Saul didn't believe him? Or was it Ahimelech's answer that, you know, triggered him? I think it was Ahimelech's answer. I think he kind of already had his mind up, made up. But then he gets this answer for Ahimelech that just kind of puts Saul over the edge. I could be wrong. But here's the thing about that, you know, his answer, look at his answer. Who is so faithful among all thy servants as David? It's like that song again. David has slain his ten thousands and Saul his thousands. It's somebody coming to him again and just praising David right to his face. His sworn enemy, the one he's just out to get. And now here comes another person just lauding David right in front of them. I, who is so faithful among thy servants is David, which is in thy king's son-in-law, and goeth at thy bidding, and is an honorable in all thy house. And I think when he's being reminded here by, the, by Amalek's answer, with Amalek not even trying, he's being reminded of the goodness of David. And you know what? He can't help but think that how he must feel. Because it might have reminded him how low he's really fallen. Because you know what? In the back of Saul's mind, he had to have known that everything that that guy just said about David is true. And now he's just feeling even more rotten. Like, man, I'm hunting down a good man. I'm hunting down, you know, someone who's been faithful to me, somebody who's gone and done all my bidding, somebody who hasn't lifted up their sword against me, somebody who is, you know, my own son-in-law. I'm hunting him down. And here's Ahimelech in his own defense, unknowingly, just reminding Saul of how good David actually is. <clears throat> and that just goes to show us that, you know, the truth offends people all on its own. The truth, and go ahead and turn over to John chapter 3. This is just a principle that we should point out. That the truth offends people when it condemns them. Because that's what's going on here. Everything that Ahimelech just said about David is absolutely true. There's none so faithful among David. He did everything that was asked of him. He was very humble. He had no ill will towards Saul at all. And he was, he was you know, honorable in all of his house. And when, Saul, and when Saul was reminded of that truth, it offends him. Why? Because it condemned him in the process. So you know, see, Saul wouldn't have minded the truth about David so much if it wasn't that that truth condemned him. Do you follow what I'm saying? If he would have said, oh yeah, that's true about David. That, everything you said is true, and you know what? And, and, since, and if, if he hadn't been hunting him down and trying to kill him, it wouldn't have bothered him. But when he hears that answer, he hears the truth, he's convicted. He's condemned, he's condemned by it. And that's why he can't stand to hear the truth. And that's true today, is that people today, when they hear the truth, the, the people that are offended by the truth are, are typically the people that are condemned by the truth. And what we should learn from this is that, you know, the truth doesn't need any help from us in order to be despised by the guilty. But we don't have to make the truth, you know, sound any worse to, to guilty people than it already does. What I'm saying is this, is that if we just love the Lord and love God's word and live for Christ, we're not going to have to go out of our way to, con to offend people. It's going to happen. All of it's just by its own accord. Because the truth offends people who are condemned by it. And people are going to see us you know, living a righteous life, living a godly life. They're going to hear the preaching of God's word. They're going to see us come to their door and tell them that they're a sinner and that they need to get a savior. And, and they're going to be offended by that because it condemns them. And we didn't have to go there and, and, and be nasty or be mean or rub their face in it. All we're doing is just living the truth, just preaching the truth, just putting it out there. We're just a Himalek saying, isn't David faithful? Isn't he the most honorable? Isn't the, isn't the word of God good? Aren't the commandments of the Lord are pure. The commandments of the Lord are just. We just lift up God's word, we praise it, we preach it, and the world just hates it. Why? Because it condemns them. That's the only reason. 
The Bible says in John 15, see, Jesus said, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. He's, he's saying, look, you didn't have to go out of your way to get the world to hate you. The world hates you because I've chosen you out of the world. Look at John chapter 3, verse 19. This is the con and this is condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Why do men love darkness rather than light? Because their deeds are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh the light, lest his deeds be reproved. Guilty people don't like the light. They don't like the truth because it condemns them. And they're offended by it. You know, First John, you know, we read all that in John. John, obviously, you know, he wrote the Gospel of John. He also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he, had, and he has a really good handle on this concept. That look, when you're chosen out of the world, you know, that just by walking in the light, just by, you know, uh, being a follower of Christ, you're going to offend people. Just naturally. It's just the way things work, that people are going to get offended by that. He's the one that wrote 1 John chapter 3. I'll read to you. It says in verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. That's a great verse. When we stop, we think about that. Man, that's amazing. God loves us so much that we should be called his sons, that we should be joint heirs with Christ. That's amazing. But that's not the end of that sentence. He goes on and says, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Look, when you got saved, when you start living for Christ, you know, without you even trying, you've, you've ostracized yourself from the world. And the world's not just going to say, oh, that's okay, you go ahead and do that. That's fine, you know, you go ahead and live that godly life, I'm glad for you. They're going to see that, and it's going to shine the light on them. They're going to examine their own life and go, and they're going to hate you for it. Why? Because you're mean, because you're nasty, because you're... You know, judging them? No, because you're just walking in the light. And they don't want to go over there. They don't want to stand where you're standing. Because if they stood over there, they'd have to admit, they'd have to have their deeds reproved. And I think that's what we can see here with the story when Ahimelech comes and just pleads his case, makes his defense. An innocent man who just says, look, I thought David was your best man. I thought he was your right-hand guy. Who's so faithful as David? Oh, I can't stand to hear that. I'm going to kill you now. Because it reminds me, Saul, right? It reminds Saul of just how wicked he really was. Look, the truth doesn't need any help from us. It will just automatically offend people when it condemns them. Let's go on here, a story. Look at verse 17. And the king said unto the footmen that stood about him, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David. So his, his defense made no difference. I mean, he was, he was condemned before he even got there. And because they knew when he fled and did not show it unto me. And, and Himmelich said, I didn't know he was fleeing from you. I thought he was just going on a mission that you didn't want anybody else to know about. But the servants of the, Lord, of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priest of the Lord. Go over to Romans chapter 13. <coughs> now, what you see here is that, you know, these people, are the people that are following Saul, are they following a good leader? They're following a bad leader. He's, 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 this is a, he is a poor leader. I mean, he's, he's, he's telling them to go kill the priests of the Lord for having done nothing wrong. And they're standing around, they're probably hearing Ahimelech and going, well, I believe him. And we all know what Doeg's about. We know Doeg and what he's, that Edomite, what he's all about. That proselyte that outsider that just came in here and got this position. And they're, they're probably thinking, well, I, we believe him. But they won't say that. <clears throat> and what we see here is that people who are following bad leadership can still have a sense of right and wrong. They can still have a line that they draw in the sand and say, well, I'm not going to go that far. And what I want us to learn from this is that, you know, we should obey authority so long as that authority is an obedience to the Lord. You know, people often ask, you know, what, at what point do you stop obeying certain authorities? Well, you stop obeying them when they ask you to do something that's sinful. And whatever, whatever authority that is on every level. You're in Romans 13, but Ephesians 6, the Bible says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. 
He didn't just, you know, elsewhere he says, you know, children obey your parents, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. But here he clarifies it. He says, in the Lord. Meaning that even if your own parent came to you and said, you know, go do something wicked, go do something sinful, the right re response would be say, no. You know, when do you disobey? When is it no longer sinful to, you know, revolt against that authority? When that authority is trying to usurp the authority of God. That's what you see in Romans chapter 13. Look at verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Notice powers is plural there. Being there's levels to power, right? You know, we all have a head over us. And the ultimate head that is over everybody is Christ. You know, God is the supreme ruler. So no matter whatever power beneath God that, might, you know, that we might be under, if that power beneath God tells us to do something against the supreme power, that's when we revolt. That's when we say no. Look at, he goes on and says, For there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. Look at verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. How I wish that was true today. They're, they're a terror to good works, and, but to evil. Today it's completely backwards. Wilt thou not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God, uh, uh, minister of God to thee for good. And he ends there again saying, for he is the minister of God. Look, the powers that be, if they're right, the ones that we should obey are the ones that are actually carrying out God's will. Okay? And so that's what we see going on here with these other Benjamites that are here with Saul, these servants of Saul. When they're asked to do something wicked, they say, we're not doing that. Look, I, we're following bad leadership, but even people who are following bad leadership, they still have some semblance of a conscience left to say, we're not crossing that line. We fear God more than men. We ought to obey God rather than men. <clears throat> but, you know, what we learn from the story is that, if you want to go back there, is that wicked people can be relied upon to do things others wouldn't. You know, you can find wicked people to do things that other people won't. I mean, basically, you know, Saul's hiring a hitman here. Now, if I were to go to any one of you and ask you to you know, knock off somebody for me for a cool, couple cool grand, you'd probably turn me in. You know, you'd probably set up a sting with some cop somewhere and get me arrested, and rightly so. But I guarantee you what, there's probably people out there that you could approach that would go right along with that. Oh, you want someone dead, or whatever. You know, they would go right along with whatever. Look, you can find wicked people who are willing to do whatever. And, you know, and though the scripture doesn't explicitly lay it out here, I believe that Doeg, the Edomite, is a reprobate. Because, I mean, look at what he's capable Because the Bible says they're implacable. They're without mercy. I mean, he, look at how far he goes. Saul's order was, you know, turn and slay the priests of the Lord. And then his servants say, no way. And the king said unto Do Doeg, turn thou and fall upon the priests. Period. Now, did he say kill everybody and everything? He said kill the priests. But Doeg, I believe is a reprobate, an implacable, unmerciful reprobate. And that's why you see him go to this extreme. Because he's just got bloodlust. And Doeg the Edomite turned and fell upon the priests and slew on that day four score and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. Now, of course, he was the one that yielded the, wielded the sword, right? But who really killed the priest that day? Saul did. You know, that's, that's, an, that's an amazing thing. You know, and people, not in a good way, but it's amazing that somebody could do something so wicked and still go to heaven. And that just goes to show you the grace of God. You know, and that's a great example sometimes that if people are familiar with the Bible and are struggling with this idea that salvation is by grace through faith, they say, well, where did Saul go? Yeah, well, what did Saul do? He scored, you know, four score, 80 and five persons, men of God priests that were wearing a linen, linen ephod. It's obvious what they were. And then he commits suicide. Right? But look at what Doeg does. He kills these guys and, and he goes, and Nob, the city of the priests, smote he with the edge of the sword. Both men and women and children and sucklings. I mean babies. And oxen. And he's like, that's not enough. He's killing the animals. I mean, I, after you're killing women and children, you can't... That's, you've hit the bottom of the barrel. But he's like, while he's at it, hey, I'm going to take out the oxen and the asses and the sheep with the edge of the sword. I mean, he just goes way beyond. what, And, and you have to wonder, it's, it's all, it's probably going, whoa, 
what have I done? And maybe at this point, Saul is like, well, I didn't want that. I mean, the women, the children, you're out of your, you went too far, but it's too late. And look, that's the problem with wicked people. You know, you give them a foot, <laughs> they'll take a mile because they're implacable. And when you turn them loose, you give them a, a, this kind of power, there's no telling what they're willing to do. To what end they'll take that, that power you give them. You've got to be real careful who you give that kind of power to. And it says in verse 20, And one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar showed David and Saul that Saul had slain the Lord's priest. So what is the narrator of the Bible? Who does the narrator of the scripture lay the blame of the deaths? Of the, who gets blamed for it? The deaths of the priest, Saul. It's, I mean, that's the narrator speaking. And, and he said that Saul had slain the priests. Now what's interesting, he keeps on there, go to Psalm 52 because David actually wrote a psalm about this. And you say, what could possess a guy like Doeg to, to do this? I mean, besides the fact that he was a reprobate, that he was just willing to do this, where, what, are, what is somebody's motive? I mean, you have to at least have a reason to want to do this, this kind of horrific, you know, just, just slaughter of, of men, women, children, babies. Well, David gives us some insight because he actually, he wrote a psalm about this. If you're there in Psalm 52... Does, your, does it have the heading over the psalm there? Right. Where it says, To the chief musician Maskile, uh, Maskile, a psalm of David, when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul and said to him, David is coming to the house of Ahimelech. So he's, he's going to write a song about this. And he says in verse 1, Why boastest thyself in mischief, O mighty man? You know, why boastest thyself in mischief? And that's what wicked people are like today. And boy, we see a lot of that today. People who are just, you know, mighty to drink wine. You know, and people who are just boasting themselves in missions. They're just bragging about their sin, bragging about their wickedness, just putting it out there, boasting themselves in mischief. Oh, mighty man. I don't think he really thinks he's that mighty. He's kind of mocking him. The goodness of God endureth continually. Thy tongue deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor working deceitfully. Thou lovest evil more than good and lying rather than to speak righteousness. You know, we can't wrap our minds around this sometimes because we're good people, but it's, it's, you have to understand that there's people out there, they love lies. They hate the truth. They love evil more than good. They, dis, they are despisers of those that are good. It's not just that they're bad. They hate good people. They love ri lying rather than speaking righteousness. You can say, why would anybody ever be like that? I don't know, but they're there. The, the, important reason, the, the important thing is to understand not why they're there, that, but just that they're there, that these people exist, that they're real, that hate good people, that love evil, that hate righteousness, that love lying. Thou lovest all devouring words, verse 4, verse four O thou deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place, and root thee out of the land of the living, Selah. The righteous also shall see and fear, and shall laugh at him. That's a great verse. And it should remind us that the Bible says that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And we see wicked things like this happen. And by the way, we see wicked like, things like this happen even today. People are just being slaughtered wholesale in this country. It's been going on, you know, in this world rather, you know, throughout all mankind. It's from the very beginning. When Cain slew Abel, and wherefore slew he him? Because he, he, his, his brother's works were righteous and his own were evil. Because the truth condemns people and they hate, the peop and hate those that condemn them. Look, wicked people are condemned by, by, by righteous people. They hate them for it. They'd rather just not retain God in their knowledge. They just don't want to even exist. They want to just snuff it out and get rid of it. So they don't have to think about how wicked they are. And look, those of us that are righteous, those of us that love the truth, that love righteousness, that love God's people, that love the Lord, you know, we see this take place. And, you know, sometimes in our flesh, we want to take matters into our own hands. We want to do something about it. You know, and, and to a certain degree, there is things that we can do about it. I mean, we have some semblance of a justice system. I mean, we have 
God has given measures for man to punish evildoers and so on and so forth, and it's up to man to you know, f carry that out, and we obviously are falling short of that. But ultimately, God, even if, even if these wicked people, these Doegs, the Edomites, go unpunished in the world, ultimately, we know their end. That God is going to do out the ultimate justice that nobody on earth ever could. You know, the best we could hope for on earth is just to help them get there a little sooner. You know, by, you know, in, in, you know uh, uh, enforcing the death penalty. You know, helping them get to the justice of God who's going to dole out the real punishment in hell. <coughs> and I love verse 6. It says, the righteous also shall see it and fear and shall laugh at him. You know, we're going to have, we're going to mock and scoff at these, these haters of God one day, once and for all. Lo, this man that made God not that made God not his made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of riches and strengthened himself in him, himself in wickedness. So why would Doeg do this? Because he's a wicked man, plain and simple. I mean that's that's the long and short of it. But you know you have to remember he's the chief herdman of Saul. He's over the other herdmen. Like he's he's you know he has a position. He's lifted up with pride. And really what it comes down to is that he, was, he cared more about his position and the advantage that he could get af, out of doing whatever for Saul. If he could just show Saul pleasure, if he could just do a solid for Saul, he'd get something in return. And he just shows that he cares about his position more than he does about people. And what I really want us to point out, and I'm almost done here tonight, is that you know, Doeg reminds us that people can come across as spiritual but will show their true colors when they're given the opportunity. I mean, I wonder if anybody there knew Doeg was capable of this. When Saul turned to Doeg and said, slay the priest, do you think he had anything, do you think he knew this about Doeg? That Doeg was just going to go kill the priest and then just kill everybody in Nob, kill all the men, kill all the women, kill all the sucklings, just kill everybody? Do you think he knew that? I don't think he did. And I wonder if he did know that, would he have still, you know, you know sick Doeg on him? He probably wouldn't have. He probably thought that Doeg, you know, might not have been the best guy that was willing to do something like this. But remember when we first met Doeg, where did we see him? In the house of God. And what was he? Detained of the Lord. So he's this proselyte, you know, Jew. You know, wasn't considered Jew then at that point in their history, but, you know, he was of the children of Israel to some degree. And we find him in the house of God with the priests. Detained of the Lord. Now, it doesn't really say why he was detained. Maybe he had some uncleanness. Maybe it was something to do with the Sabbath. There's all these different reasons. I'm not really going to go into it. But the point being this is that he's observing in some way a religious ceremony. That Doeg is coming across as a religious guy, right? And he's in the house of God. He's serving the king of Israel. He's a spiritual guy. He's a religious person. He's detained on them. But you know what? When you gave him a chance to show his true colors, he did. He showed himself to be the reprobate, false prophet that he was. The hater of God that he really was. And the Bible, and this is what we have to understand tonight, is that these people are real. They exist. You know, and, and I remember hearing this preached over and over again and saying, yeah, I'm sure, but never here. That'll never happen to me. I'll never say anything that personally in my own life. And then you do. And then you see it once and you think, well, it's a fluke. That'll never happen again. And then it happens again. These people show themselves to be what they are, these wolves in sheep clothing that are snuck in privily to, to just cause harm and hurt, that are unmerciful. And then you see it another time, you're kind of like, okay, maybe the Bible's true. <laughs> maybe the preacher's just not full of hot air. Maybe he's not just being overly dramatic up there. And I'm here to tell you tonight, I'm not. This is This is reality. There are dough eggs out there even unto this day. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Now, I'm almost done. I know I keep saying that. The Bible says in Jude 1, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Cori. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Look, he's, they're gonna, he's saying, look, these, these false prophets, these wolves in sheep clothing, they're going to feast. They're going to be in your feasts of charity. You're going to, we're going to sit down to a, to a love, you know, with loved ones at a feast of charity, right? We're going to have the potluck. 
Everyone's going to bring all the great food. We're all, we're all going to just love on each other and have a good time of fellowship. But you know what? It just might be that there's somebody in there that's just a spot. A spot in your Feast of Charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, whose trees who fruit wither with without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Look at Second Peter chapter two, verse one. But there were false prophets also among the people, and even as there shall be false teachers among you, who shall privily bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and shall bring upon themselves swift destruction. Look, Peter's giving this warning, and this applies to us. People are going to creep in. They're going to try to infiltrate churches. You know, and we look around and say, this is just a little church. Why would anybody do that here? I don't know, but they do. Because the devil doesn't like, you know, churches like this doing, you know, reaching souls and preaching the Bible. He wants to bring it to a halt. He wants to cause harm. He fights against it. So he sends people like this in. And the scary thing is, sometimes you wonder, do these people even know that they're doe eggs? Do they even know that they're being used in the devil? I, I, I would argue that they don't even realize that they're even being used that way. Maybe not in every instance. And here's the thing, you know, when you preach like this, you always got you to you gotta give this, you know, this, uh, this warning or this caveat. You know, you got to kind of make this and say, now look, don't go on the witch hunt, <laughs> you know. Don't go trying to sniff out and find out who it is. The, you know, is there a Judas out there? I don't know. But I could tell you one thing. There's going to be at some point. Maybe he's come and gone already. Maybe he's on his way. Maybe he's here right now. I don't know. But you know what? I, I assume the best about people until they give me a reason otherwise. I mean, Doeg, you know, everyone was thinking, well, he was at the house of the Lord, you know. And then it's like, go slay these priests. Sure. And then we're like, whoa. Look, what, look to the extreme he went. And I'm just saying, look, people can put on a spiritual front, but you give it time and you wait for the, and, and when they have opportunity, they'll show you their true colors and there'll be no denying what they are. <clears throat> now, I want to point out one last thing, okay, because you got to point this out in this passage, all right? <coughs> Go to 1 Samuel chapter 2. Look, Doeg's actions were wicked. No one's going to deny that, right? They're wicked. And I want to understand, and I'm going I'm to say something here, and I'm going to point out something, but you need to understand something, is that sometimes God lets wicked people do things to carry out his judgment on other people. Right. You know, sometimes we think, oh, God's going you know, to judge people like he's directly going to do something, Right? And, you know, in a way, he is directly doing something, but he's using a human instrument to do it. You know, people, people want to argue whether or not, you know, the coronavirus was the judgment of God. Say, well, it wasn't the judgment of God, you know, if it's man-made in a, in a lab somewhere. Yeah, but if it was man-made in a lab somewhere, God let that happen, therefore it is still the judgment of God. And by the way, I don't believe it was man-made in a lab somewhere. I mean, maybe, but I'm not going to spend all my days trying to get to the bottom of coronavirus. <clears throat> but I'm saying this tonight, is that God uses wicked people to judge people that he's cursed. Right. And as terrible as this story is, you have to remember that Ahimelech is cursed. Right. If you go back to Second Sam 1 Samuel chapter 2, look at verse 31. That's what he told Eli. When, he, when, when Eli did not restrain his sons, God cursed his lineage. He said, Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm, and the arm of thy father's house, and there shall not be an old man in thine house. What's he saying here? None of your seed is going to live to an old age. They're all going to die young. That was the curse that God put on Eli's house. And thou shalt see an enemy in thy habitation, and all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. He repeats himself. So all the way back there, God is cursing the seed of Eli. Right? Now, who is Ahimelech? Ahimelech is the son of Eli because he is the son of Ahitub. That is the lineage that you follow through. If you're there in 1 Samuel 22, look at verse 12. Well, that's what Saul calls him. He says, Hear now, thou son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here am I, my Lord. You know, he owned that tile. Right? That's who he is. But in 1 Samuel chapter 14, I'll read to you. You can go there if you want. It says, And Ahiah, the son of Ahitub. So Ahiah is another guy who is also the son of Ahitub. Son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother. 
Now, Ichabod is the, son, is the, is the grandson of Eli. Ahiah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother. Ahiah is Ichabod's brother. That's the lineage. The son of Phinehas, who is the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. So that's the lineage there. Ahimelech, unfortunately for him, is born, you know, what's the saying? Born under a bad, I guess that doesn't play, born under a bad sign. That's probably like some Zodiac thing. But he's cursed from his birth. I mean, he's living under, in a cursed lineage. And you say, well, I just, that doesn't sound very fair of God. Well, you know, that, that should just be a warning to the rest of us, particularly us fathers, that you can curse your children, that your actions have consequences for generations to come. And, you know what, and what it shows us, more importantly, is that God will allow wicked people like Doeg to do what they're going to do. And, 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 cur and, 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 you know, and, and unfortunately, you know, a lot of other people got hurt in the process. You know, the priest got taken out. Now, did God determine that Doeg was going to do all those other things? Probably not. But he let Doeg go ahead and kill all those priests. And you know, while he was at it, Doeg went and did everything else he did. And it says there, we'll just wrap it up in verse 22. And David said to Abiathar, I knew it that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. David's owning the blame here. Now, is David wrong to say that? You know, there's a grain of truth to that. Whether he meant to or not, David is saying, look, I'm owning this because I'm the one that put your father in that position. Now, David should take it easy on himself, given the fact that Ahimelech is cursed. You know, Ahimelech, if they had any sense, you know, after they'd seen this happen over and over again, you would think after Eli, you know, after what happened with uh, Eli's sons, you know, when they get killed in one day, and Ichabod and the whole thing, and, the, and all that, they would have said, you know, maybe the priesthood's not for us anymore. <laughs> maybe we should just listen to what God said, you know, because remember, when that happened, there was another priest called Samuel. And he went around doing the, the priestly duties and stuff like that. But they wanted to hang on to that position. God's like, well, if you want to stay there, I'll just keep right on cursing you all along the way. So though there is a grain of truth to what David is saying, that he kind of occasioned the death of these people, he should take it easy on himself because they were going to get it one way or another. Because unfortunately, they're living you know, in, in a cursed seed. Now, was Ahimelech a bad guy? You know, we don't see anything that shows that he's a particularly bad person. But you know what? God's no respecter of persons. And, and when God's determined to judge people, you know, the best you can hope for is just mercy. So he says to him, Abide thou with me, fear not. He that seeketh my life seeketh thy life, but with me thou shalt be in safeguard. So he offers him, you know, the opportunity to come and at least, you know, not die at the hands of Doeg. So, you know, that's the sermon tonight. There's a lot of, a lot of lessons that we can learn from that chapter, you know, and... and one of the things we should, should definitely just take note of is the fact that you're going to go through persecutions in this life. You need to be faithful like David. You know, and, and if you're faithful like David, that's kind of going to ensure that you are persecuted because if you're faithful like David, you're going to offend people just by living a righteous life. But that's no reason for us to not do that. You know, we should be willing to take the bad with the good. We should receive good of the Lord as well as evil. You know, we have to take both. We can't have this buffet mentality with Christianity where I only want this, the, 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 the nice, easy things about Christianity, but none of these other things that are more, you know, unpleasant. It's both, you know, and David is a good example of somebody who understood that and was still able to walk by faith, be faithful to the Lord, and in the long run, in the, in, in the, you know, overall, at the end of his life, you know, after all these trials, he came out on top. You know, he came out blessed of the Lord. And we can have that too. But, you know, we have to be faithful in all our tribulations. You know, we have to be faithful when we go through those things. That's when it really counts. Let's go ahead and pray.